very much the chairpersons. Uh, certainly, I wasn't born in, in an era where the stethoscope was invented. That was 500 years ago. <laughs> but I did practice a great deal, and I was trained in an era where largely it was just the stethoscope that was used. So I learned the basics of clinical medicine, where a stethoscope really meant that it was just the symbol of medical profession. And what it meant was, Sir Lennox thought that stethoscope was used largely for the chest examination. However, thereafter, the scope was much widened and widened to an extent that we not only use the stethoscope to look at the abdomen, to look at peristalsis, or might be even put on the skull to hear any other sounds, but I think the earlier physicians widened the scope of clinical medicine to treat the entire family and the child and just not the disease. Over years that I was trained in early 60s and now, I feel that the generation has started treating disease and not a child and lately not even a disease but just the laboratory tests. This is how we have evolved as the modern medicine evolved. However, the microscopes and telescopes were also invented 500 years ago. But they came into clinical medicine rather recently in the last decade. Well, that's certainly a symbol of medical advances. But what it means is, it's the narrow vision that is magnified. And I think we need to look at, when do we need that narrow vision magnified? Otherwise, we would end up with small problems appearing big and a bigger problem going out of focus. And I think that's where the stethoscope to microscope area has evolved. Certainly it doesn't mean that the medical science has not evolved to benefit the majority. But probably it's a time to decide how we look at a stethoscope era as a traditional wisdom. The earlier physicians, much without any aids, 100% did a lot good to the community, with probably just the concern, the compassion, etc. And all that they had was the detailed history and the focused physical examination. Even probably the relevant confirmative tests were not available. But thereafter the era came where there was a search for evidence-based diagnosis, often ignoring basics and treating the laboratory tests as I said. But what did the tests offer? Most of the tests offered either a structural or a functional abnormalities, but often not the etiology. And today, if we have evolved to understand a lot about neurodegenerative diseases, a demyelinating disorders, a malignancy of all kinds, still, etiology eludes us totally. And that's where the failure of the modern science still exists. Again, it's not to say that the medical science has not advanced, but probably we need to decide when is the indication for using it. Today, the indication of using CT scan of the brain is a brain available and a CT scan available. <laughs> Physician must use his brain, and if that is not used, then the CT scan is misused. And I think that's where we go by. Let's look at what has happened over the last 50 years that I've been in pediatrics. <clears throat> and I looked at the neonatal care, and when I was trained, the only neonatal care was warmth and the breastfeeding. And thereafter, the neonatologists <coughs> invented many things, and they wanted to isolate a neonate so that he doesn't get infection. And they used the prophylactic antibiotics to a very small infant, and they used the surfactant before he started respiratory distress. They gave him IV fluids because he could not tolerate total freaks. And they tried to match the expected growth that would have occurred antenatally. Today we know that we are probably back into the era of kangaroo care, that you just produce the warm tattoo by the mother, and probably that takes a lot. Again, not to consider that those advances have not saved, but the majority did not need all that, and only the minority required. What happened about fever? We were taught that in first two days of fever, diagnosis was not easy, or rather not possible. And all that you did was just rule out a serious illness and a periodic observation. 
and then only the specific tests were possible before you even used an antibiotic. Well, today we are in a hurry to diagnose. Therefore, we want to do a laboratory test. What has happened? We do a CBC. What is CBC? Looks like a complete blood count, but with incomplete interpretation. We understand neutrophilic leukocytosis could be seen in viral infection. We know neutrophilic leukocytosis is seen in a systemic inflammatory disease. We know a disease like typhoid has a leukopenia, even if it's an acute bacterial infection. Then we got onto ESR and we thought that it would tell us how severe the disease is still on. But we are not happy because we said ESR gets up only after 24 or 48 hours and lingers for a long time. So we got onto CRP and we wanted it in a hurry to diagnose right on first day. But we realized that CRP gets out quickly too. We were not happy with that and we came on a procalcitonin which should be fine within four hours. I'm sure the next year there would be a test to say infection has come to the neighbor and she went. Well, that may not be an answer to the ultimate issues. Uh, when we have an imaging, all that we had in imaging was just the image that you could see by eye. After all, what is imaging? It's an imagination. Radiologists imagine. That's what imagine is. If I show you an, an object across the window pane, across the road, and if a radiologist asks, what's that? He would say that looks like he's on four, so must be a dog. <laughs> now he could be wrong because a human being could be kneeling on four. And if he sees an image on two, it could be a dog standing on two. He just imagines what normally expects. And it's a clinician again. But we are not happy. We went to an ultrasound, we went to CT, now several types of CT and MR and so on. But the point is, all of them has given us only the structural images. I recall suddenly when the CT scan came to India, there were a spate of epidemic of a demyelinating disorders in infancy until the radiologists realized that myelin was not yet formed. <laughs> And we have to wait for that error to come. This is how probably we have learned how this is. How was the diarrhea treated in times memorable? The physician knew that you had a light diet and the plenty of fluids and how much of fluids as per the demand of the child. There were no drugs and they did very well. Thereafter we got a stool examination, then we got stool lactose. The worst thing that happened was somebody found out lactose in a stool, least realizing that every loose stool would have a lactose, but that brought in a lactose-free formula as well. And thereafter we did a stool culture, we didn't bother how we collected it, and whatever E. coli we got, we were happy about it, and we started even treating that. Then it came an ORS, the great invention of the whole decade, and we said after every stool, get the baby to drink ORS, and then we had a special formula, because the child will not tolerate it. Least we realize this. Realize that, that the, even a small infant has an inherent sensing of needs of fluids. What it meant was that not every baby with diarrhea really craved for ORS. And there would be a, some baby who would refuse ORS but drink only water. It took a long time for the laboratory people to understand that a baby who craves for water and doesn't take ORS is not losing electrolytes in a stool and it's just losing water. Thereafter, now we have realized that leave it to the baby. It took a lot of time for all of us with great wisdom to realize that even an infant knows much better what he should be doing and not his physician. But whenever we decided for the baby, we often got into trouble and that's how today we are back on to say, give any fluids, the baby will decide how much and the baby will decide which fluid. And then we had a chronic abdominal pain, which was the biggest problem. And when we saw that, we realized that when I was trained, there was nothing much of investigation. 
and my teacher said that if there is no quadrant pain, do not worry a great deal. A periumbilical pain, just evaluate clinically, observe periodic examination and don't go after tests or drugs. But thereafter, we had an abdominal USG. The greatest disadvantage of an abdominal USG is that a microscopic error shows a small problem very big. Every ultrasonologist picked up mesenteric lymph node, a small peritoneal fluid, a thickened ileocecal junction, a thickened bladder. They did not know that if the bladder was contracted, the looked like a thickened bladder wall and they said cystitis. Clinicians believed it. What a pity. Clinicians did not believe their own vision and believed somebody else's vision. And I think that's where we got into trouble and therefore we were confused more than help and that only meant that you had to do a CT, you had to do an endoscopy, you had to do a biopsy and finally a surgeon said I will explore and tell you there is nothing wrong. Uh, so that's where I think we, we came up to. I'll just give you an illustrative case of these are the real cases and this eight month old child came with persistent vomiting for two months. There were no other apparent symptoms and physical examination was normal. Well this child was losing weight so you had to do something and you were in a microscopic error so you did several investigations including GI, hepatic, renal, CNS, every disease kind of was considered and ruled out but the personal history was missed. When we asked this mother, she said that he had severe anorexia. He was very irritable. He was constipated. There was a polyuria. That became a syndrome of uh, idiopathic hypercalcemia. You couldn't have guessed that before you did a GI series and the CNS investigation, etc. What a pity. As an undergraduate, we have talked about personal history and there are situations where that saved people from doing anything beyond. This was another evidence where an 8 year old child came with an acute onset fever followed by breathlessness within 18 hours. This was a healthy child who came in the evening from school, got fever. Next morning he was breathless, he was rushed to an emergency and they diagnosed a pleural effusion. It was an exudate with neutrophils. A blood count also had a neutrophil leukocytosis. So they said this is a simple empyema. Put in a drainage tube, give an antibiotic. There was no response. What do you do? Change antibiotic. And then what happened? What was missed was an incorrect interpretation. An acute onset pleural effusion is not the infection and empyema. It was an allergic effusion due to TB. This taught us how the neutrophilic leukocytosis would take you somewhere else and the literature would show that as many as 30% of children with tuberculosis may have a neutrophilia as well. That doesn't mean that it's an acute bacterial infection. Well, all that I want to say is that today we have moved into a modern scientific era. It has certainly done wonders. It has done wonders to only few who require it. And I recall several times when two things were missed by modern clinicians. One is that they did not apply a simple wisdom that the nature has endowed on human beings. And I'll give you an example of what happened. A person went to his family physician and he said that he was having a little periorbital edema. The family physician promptly referred this to a nephrologist. And nephrologist had to do multiple investigations and announced that the kidneys were normal. But he found that there were little veins in the neck prominent. So he said, I think you must go to a cardiologist. Cardiologist knew that the clinical examination, the echo, everything was normal. But he knew many other investigations, the radionuclide scanning, what not. He said, heart is normal, I bet, everything is fine. But he found that the eyes were prominent. So he referred him to an endocrinologist. And he did a lot of hormonal studies, convinced that thyroid was OK. The man came de dejected to his family physician and said, Sir, what's happening to me? He said, look, you must be having a very rare disease. Because the spe specialists have not understood in spite of yes. So what do you do? He said, then I let me enjoy my wealth, go around the world trip, <coughs> went to buy a branded shirt. And the man at the... The counter said, sir, what's your color size? He said, 14. Sir, it's 16. If you wear 14, your face will be puffy, your veins will be... <laughs> so that, that's, where, that's where I think the clinician stands for the 
husband knew that. And then I said, that today's family physician and the pediatrician, as we are all general pediatrician, must think of the most common. And if you don't think of the most common, then you are in trouble. A super specialist had to be an excellent generalist. He should not think about the rare first, because the common things appear commonly in thing. And I remember we showed a cow to an intern who had just finished his MPBL. And I said, what's this animal? He said, sir, cow. I said, differential diagnosis. He said, none. He was so sure. Then I showed the same animal to an MD. He had gone to special training. I said, what's this animal? He said, cow, but we need to be investigating and you should. Because he had learned the evidence-based medicine. And then I showed the same animal to a DM. He was a super specialist. He said, sir, there are many possibilities. So I said, what all possibilities? He said, this may be an atrophic elephant. So I said, how can you say that? He said, sir, in 1970 in Lancet, uh, there is one report of similar thing. I was impressed about his knowledge. I said, what next? He said, it could be a hypertrophic goat. So he gave many possibilities. Finally, I said, what about cow? He said, if all that is ruled out, it may be cow. Again, a point that you have to have a common thing. So let me summarize and say that where are we missing something? A holistic care. What is holistic care? Using brain, heart, mind and soul. What is brain to a clinician? A knowledge. What is heart to a clinician? A sympathy. What is mind to a clinician? A commitment. What is soul to a clinician? A conscience. I think we combine all that. There is no question the knowledge has gone so much. And therefore, it's a traditional wisdom of detailed history and focused examination. That is largely enough for majority. I'm sure for some small number, you need a laboratory test, but not without traditional wisdom. Thank you very much.